This is going to be pretty shocking for some of you. There is a dividing line in the book of Romans. This changes our understanding of the golden chain of redemption and who the elect are. The elect. Romans is actually a letter of reconciliation between the Jew and the Gentile believers. And those whom he called, these he also justified. Those whom he justified, these he also glorified. The Roman church at this time transitioned from predominantly a Jewish church, now mainly to a Gentile church, after the expulsion of the Jews. You can not break this chain. Welcome back to our two-part Romans series. This is session 10. Does two-part Romans align with the Gospel of John? I appreciate all your comments over the last few months. One of my favorite comments was a friend saying, you were right, Jason, I am amazed. I know some of you may have watched all nine sessions and are thinking, well, Jason, the 101 to none points of evidence in favor of two-part Romans were truly amazing. And others may add that the 25 points of corroborating evidence from Paul's other writings of the last two sessions leaves no doubt. But some of you might be thinking, Jason, why are you even mentioning a possible correlation with the Gospel of John? Are you insinuating that John and Paul have the same perspective? The answer, of course, is yes. As I've stated in earlier sessions, our God is not a God of confusion. The gospel, as presented by Paul in writing about two-thirds of the New Testament, is the same gospel presented by John, who wrote five books of the New Testament. John wrote the gospel account, the three short letters, and the book of Revelation. As a former Calvinist, the Gospel of John was usually one of my major touch points as proof for Calvinism. I think this is fair to say for most Calvinists. John 6.44 is one of the major anchors for Calvinism. When I was a Calvinist, I sometimes began with the golden chain of redemption of Romans chapter 8, for those he foreknew, he predestined. And then I moved quickly to Ephesians 1.4, where he knew you before the foundation of the world. And then I moved and added John 6.44. Jesus said only those drawn by the Father can come to him. Foreknew and predestined from Romans 8.30. Knew before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1.4. And no one can come to me unless the Father draws them from John 6, 44. And there you have it, a Calvinism trifecta in less than a minute. A three-legged stool is used for other theological positions, but it is many times used as a model for Calvinism. The three legs are first, the golden chain of redemption. The second is Ephesians 1, 4. And the third is John 6, 44. The first leg has been clearly drawn out that in this two-part Roman series, there have been 101 reasons as to why the golden chain belongs to the remnant of the Jews. The second leg is, yes again, true in its proper context. We documented that this verse is 100% applicable to Paul and his fellow Jewish believers. The proper exegesis of those first 13 verses of Ephesians define that the we were Paul and fellow Jews. This was discussed in session 8. Now this brings us to the all-important third leg, or third major tenet of Calvinism, which is the topic of this session, John chapter 6. As with our previous sessions, as good Bereans, I remind you, we must always begin with the process of proper exegesis. And again, I recommend Gordon Fee's best-selling book, Exegesis. 
Proper exegesis leads us to three very important observations. If you are writing anything down about this session, I encourage you to write down these three observations of the Gospel of John. I encourage you to read John repeatedly and verify these three observations for yourself. Number one, in the Gospel of John, almost all the time, the encounters of Jesus are with Jews. There are 17 notable encounters with Jewish individuals or groups, primarily consisting of interactions with Jewish leaders, crowds, or individuals of Jewish background. Look at the full list right here. As well, only three notable encounters with non-Jews or Gentiles as listed here. Let us not forget that Jesus came to his own. His own was Israel. He came to the Jew first. Point number two, as in Romans, the distinction between Jew and Gentile in the Gospel of John is very significant. Number three, the Gospel of John represents a transitional time as many had a faith relationship with the Father before the resurrection and therefore could be described as Old Testament saints. I realize that many of you have not heard the term Old Testament saints applied to persons of the New Testament in this transitional time. This term is not unique with me though. Listen as John MacArthur explains in his sermon years ago. Remember Apollos, a certain Jew born in Alexandria, an eloquent, and it means eloquent and learned man, a mighty in the scripture, the Old Testament, came to Ephesus, and you remember the story, he, he was instructed in the way of the Lord, he was fervent in his spirit, he was speaking and teaching Jesus, but he knew only the baptism of John, which means that he knew Jesus was Messiah, but came up short of the cross and the resurrection. Verse 26, he began to speak, Aquila and Priscilla took him home, and it says they explained unto him the way of God more perfectly. They gave him full knowledge of the work of Christ, and of course he believed and became a New Testament saint, and then he went in verses 27 and 28, back to Corinth and watered what Paul had planted. It says he helped much them who believed through grace, and he publicly convinced the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So here we see two people in transition. Paul was a Christian, hanging on to Judaistic features. Apollos was an Old Testament saint who needed to be brought to Christ. Thirdly, we come to our third group in transition, and that's in verses 1 to 7 in chapter 19. And I want you to see this clearly. Now, in this particular little portion of seven verses, God is still picking up some Old Testament loose ends. These are Old Testament saints. I'm convinced of that. Old Testament saints who were followers of John the Baptist, who had not yet even heard about all of the features of Jesus Christ. And so they're still caught in the transition. As Old Testament saints, they need to be given the fullness of knowledge that they might become a part of the church. I agree with John MacArthur. I too am convinced there were Old Testament saints during this transitional period. You ask, well, what is the transitional period? It is the time in the New Testament before the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Recognizing this is very important. Think about this. Here in the New Testament writings are those who had a faith relationship with the Father prior to the resurrection of Jesus. I want you to listen closely to the next three clips and please understand that I share these short clips not out of disrespect for these men, but like so many of you, I very much respect their ministries and have learned much from their teaching. I share these short clips for teaching purposes to demonstrate the contrast of interpretation. Listen closely. As we proceed, make special note if you hear any one of them emphasize that Jesus is addressing Jews and not Gentiles. Also note if you hear an emphasis upon the distinction of the Jews or a mention of this transitional period in the New Testament before the resurrection. So first, listen as my debate opponent, James White, expounds on John 6:44. All that the Father gives me, verse 37, will come to me, and the one coming to me I will never cast out. We love the one coming to me I will never cast out. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. But that's the second half of a sentence. <laughs> and there's a lot of people 
who like the second half of the sentence, but they don't like the first half of the sentence, where Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The Father is sovereign, and the Father gives a people to the Son, and as a result of being given by the Father to the Son, they will come to Jesus. And he says, I've come down out of heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of the one who sent me, that of all that he's given me, I lose none of it, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus has to be a powerful and perfect Savior to be able to fulfill the words that he gives us in John 6, 39. Well, the Jews begin grumbling because Jesus' teaching has been focused upon himself. And everyone who receives this teaching, who has heard and learned from the Father, comes to me. So there's this, this divine act on the part of the Father who reveals the Son. And as a result of that supernatural action, those who receive this great blessing come to Christ. And what does Jesus say? The one coming to me, I will what? I will never cast out. Salvation is all the work of God. There is no place for us to insert ourselves in there and go, yeah, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they did everything they could. But if I hadn't given my approval, if I hadn't added my 1%, then everything the Father, Son, and Spirit did would have come to failure. That is the essence of what many Christians do believe, but that's... That's not the teaching of Christ. You see, James White takes the position, when it comes to your salvation for eternity, you do not have any say, not even 1%, as he stated. I regretfully admit that I used to say the same thing as a Calvinist. Now for a comparison, listen to how John Piper interprets John 6, 44. So what we find here is uh, verse 44, and that's very controversial. So let me read it to you. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 44. The non-controversial part of that verse is I will raise him up on the last day. At least it's, it's not controversial among believers. That's a glorious truth. We saw it mentioned twice last week, once in verse 39, once in verse 40 that uh, Jesus wants us to know that what's at stake here in coming to him is our eternal destiny and whether we'll be raised from the dead or not at the end of the age into life. So that's not part of the controversy and we lingered over it last time and I won't spend any time on it now. The controversial part is at the beginning of the verse, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And the reason it's controversial, at least one reason, is because it could mean two different things. Let me give you the two possible meanings. And both of these have been uh, argued for extensively for hundreds of years. The first meaning would go something like this. No one can come to Jesus without God's drawing, and God draws everyone but only some come. So God's drawing everyone is not the decisive reason why they come. It simply makes coming possible. And then those who come provide from themselves the decisive impulse for the coming. That's one meaning, very commonly argued for. So, nobody can come unless the Father draws, and He draws everybody. And the reason any don't come is because they don't provide the decisive impulse from their will, and the reason some do come is because they do then add to that grace and provide the decisive, that's a very key word in this sermon, decisive impulse. I never mean it as exclusive or only. I just mean the one that's deciding the issue. Okay, that's one meaning. Now here's the other meaning. It could mean no one can come to Jesus without God's drawing them, and everyone he draws does in fact come. Because his drawing is infallibly effective. It produces 
its result. It, he draws and they come. All of them come. And so clearly then he wouldn't be drawing everybody, at least not in the same way. So those are the two possible meanings. Verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How does he say, I have come down from heaven? So in verse 33, 35, 38, he has said something to the effect of, I'm the bread of life. I came down from heaven. If you will eat this bread, you will have eternal life. If you come to me, if you believe in me, if you are satisfied in me, feast on all that God is for you in me, you will have eternal life. So come, feast, eat, enjoy, be saved, have life. And the resistance gets greater and greater. Now they're murmuring about how this can be. This resistance here in the form of grumbling um, has a content to it. They say, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? His father and mother we know. So he can't be from heaven. We know where he's from. He's from here. We know his mom and dad. So the words of Jesus about himself are colliding with the perception and the reasonings of these folks. We see something and we think something about what we see. And the words of Jesus collide with what they think they see and what they're thinking. And this collision produces great grumbling on their their part. This is a standard collision. It's happening in this room right now. And it will increase over the next 30 minutes. To John Piper's credit, he said that his interpretation of John 6 causes a great controversy or a great collision as he described. And yes, indeed, it is a great collision of all the teaching in God's Word. Either you were born with the capacity to be saved or you were among those who were predestined never to be the elect. You never had a chance to go to heaven. Is that the gospel, that you and millions of others were doomed and predestined to be doomed? Were you and many of your loved ones potentially never to have the chance for an eternal home of bliss and peace called heaven with Christ? No chance, no hope. Is this supposed to be the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? Perhaps John MacArthur describes this controversial passage best. Listen here. This is a heartbreaking moment. So how does he react? Listen to how he reacts. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Wow, amazing. Well, what is he doing there? I'll tell you what he is doing. He's leaning hard on divine election. He's doing exactly what you have to do. He's doing exactly what I have to do to explain the same exact circumstance. What, why don't they believe? Why don't they listen? Why don't they come? Why don't they accept? Why don't they acknowledge? The, the truth, it's so, it's so wonderful, it, it, it's, it's so evident, it's so powerful. Why don't they react? And where do you go? Eventually you rest in the sovereign purpose of God, right? I don't, want to, I don't want to break your world apart, but I will just tell you this, Jesus was the first Calvinist in the New Testament. He just leaned hard on divine sovereign election and divine sovereign calling, and He knew that no one could come unless the Father drew Him. So all the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. In that sense, He's like us. We didn't come down from heaven, but His one goal in life was to do the will of the Father, and He knew the Father had a will, and that the Father's will would be fulfilled, and He rested in that. 
Verse 39, this is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me I lose none but raise it up on the last day. He backs up into this great, massive, overwhelming doctrine of divine sovereign election in salvation, that no one is going to believe unless the Father decides He must believe. Verse 44, no one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him. In the tenth chapter of John, there's a very similar text. In uh, verse 26, again, He's always facing this rejection. Verse 26, you do not believe. You do not believe because you're not of My sheep. My sheep hear My voice and I know them, and they follow Me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of My hand. My Father, who has given them to Me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand." Again, the same scenario. You don't believe. You don't believe. But then again, those who are the fathers, who are given to Me, who then become My sheep, will hear, will believe, I will receive, I will keep, I will raise." This is, this is a great statement of our Lord's confidence in divine sovereign election and calling unto salvation. And then in verse 40, the other side, "'For this is the will of My Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life and I will raise Him on the last day." Do you see that? That, that? that is the apparent paradox. That is the two sides of the everlasting discussion about the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. Verses 37, 38, 39, the Father draws, the Father wills, it's all His plan. And then in verse 40, Jesus looks at the other side and says, everyone who believes, everyone who believes. There's no self-consciousness here. There's no effort to explain the mystery of this great reality. I will raise those up whom the Father gives Me. I will also raise up anyone who believes. I just want to comfort you in saying even our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't explain to a middle ground. He doesn't look for some bridge between those two challenging realities. But the bottom line for us in this text is they didn't believe. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. The mystery of this great reality, yes, that's what I'm about to explain. John MacArthur described it as the apparent paradox, and he is correct. This debate about the sovereignty of God and human responsibility has been around for a long, long time. It is so important that you and I get this teaching right. It matters for all of eternity. I pray this controversy of the ages is about to go away, for you at least. Did you notice that none of these men emphasized the distinction of the Jews? Did they emphasize that Jesus was dealing with these grumbling Jews? Not one of them mentioned that this was a transitional time before the resurrection of Christ. This is an excerpt from my February 24, 2024 debate with James White, and hopefully it allows you some insight. There is another dividing line that I see here in John chapter 3. Calvin said in his commentary on John chapter 3, verse 16, faith in Christ brings life to all and that Christ brought life because the heavenly Father loves the human race and wishes that they should not perish. You can read that directly from his commentary. I bring up John 3 because I think there is significant importance. And again, just going with the theme of, I, I'm not doing this because I want to do this. I'm doing this because I see it in the text. John's Gospel, 71 times, uses the word iodius. Chapter 1, verse 11, there's an expression to the Jews, Jesus came to His own, but His own did not receive Him. Who are His own? That is the Jews. Calvin affirms this. God was manifested in the flesh to the Jews. And if you go to chapter, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name. We see in John 4, that salvation is of the Jews. 
So there is a massive Jewish theme in John's gospel that I think we cannot deny. Um, but the dividing line is how, where, where this is in redemptive history. Jesus' ministry and incarnation, we're still in Old Covenant. The New Covenant is not established until his resurrection. And so I see the dividing line in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. We know the context of John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, and he reminds Nicodemus about the serpent in the wilderness from Numbers 21.9, which says, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and as it happened, that if the serpent bit any man when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. The provision was made to those who looked to the serpent, and Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's not the dividing line, just so you know. That just proves that there must be, uh, the provision is provided to those who look to Christ. That's the parallel. But God's provision has always been conditional. Just as the Israelites only had the death angel pass over them, there's a difference between the lamb being slaughtered and the blood being applied to the door. The provision didn't take place unless the blood was applied to the door. Notice what Jesus says to Nicodemus, or what he doesn't say, I should say, is that Jesus does not tell him, repent and believe, Nicodemus. Why does he not do that? Because we, in John's gospel, he's telling Nicodemus, you're the teacher of the law and you don't understand these things. Don't you know that there's a promised new covenant going back to Jeremiah 31, 31? Don't you know that the Holy Spirit is promised? There's so many things that Jesus could have drew out there. Maybe he did, it's not recorded. But there's so many things that he could draw out to Nicodemus. He was speaking his language. Nicodemus would have known these things. In John 4, 23, Jesus also professes that the true worshipers of the Father will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And later says that those that would follow Jesus were true worshipers of the Father and that they would follow Jesus because they knew that he came from the Father. Okay, those, this is the Jewish audience. Uh, the dividing line, I see this in verse 14 and 15, where it says, the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that, conjunction, whoever believes, condition, will have eternal life, provision. This is a future promise that the new covenant is coming. Salvation is coming to whosoever believes. And you have to think what is going on in Nicodemus's mind, like how could God be stretching out his arms to the whole world? I thought he was here making the covenant with just, just us, the Jews. You see, if we miss the great distinction that Paul made in Romans between Jews and Gentiles, we likely will not be sensitive to the same distinction about Jews in John 6.44. In John 6, it was the grumbling Jews Jesus was addressing. These were the non-believing Jews. Just as John MacArthur pointed out in John chapter 10, Jesus knew his sheep and his sheep knew him. John 10 verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep which are not from this fold, I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. His sheep were those who had a faith relationship with the Father prior to the resurrection of Jesus. They were the ones given by the Father. Who are the sheep of the other fold? Who will hear the voice of Jesus? Yes, that other fold are those of us who now believe after his death and resurrection. That is why I describe the cross as the dividing line of redemptive history. Look with me at those verses of John 6.39 and 6.40. These are the verses that John MacArthur described as an apparent paradox. Verse 39 says, Now this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Well, there we have it. Those given by the Father were the Old Testament saints in the presence of Jesus. These Jews already had a faith relationship 
with the Father prior to the resurrection of Christ. Jesus knew them, and they knew Jesus, because Jesus and the Father are one. Let me say that again. Those given by the Father were those Old Testament saints in the presence of Jesus. These Jews already had a faith relationship with the Father prior to the resurrection of Christ. Jesus knew them, and they knew Jesus, because Jesus and the Father are one. Now look quickly with me at verse 40, which is almost identical to verse 39. Almost. Verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Who is the second group? Yes, indeed, it is you and I and all who believe in him on this side of the cross, the dividing line of redemptive history. He promises to raise us up on the last day. Hallelujah! Allow me to say this succinctly and sincerely. If we blur the dividing line of redemptive history, we blur the gospel. The cross is the dividing line. Calvinism makes John 6:44 a moment prior to the cross a prescriptive statement for how salvation works, when in reality John 6 is a descriptive statement on how true worshipers believed in Jesus prior to the cross. As I said again, if we blur the dividing line of redemptive history, we blur the gospel, the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. Everlasting life or perish, that is how Jesus described the gravity of our decision. And yes, I say decision because you see in Scripture tells us a decision is required. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Those are decisions. Those are actions that you take. Remember our alliteration graphic from session 7. Cap to be saved or capacity to be saved, the mystery revealed. Romans 16, 25 and 26 says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the Gentiles, leading to obedience of faith. The mystery revealed was that anyone could believe, leading to obedience of faith, that includes you, that includes me. Yes, this is exactly the invitation expressed in John 3.16. Whosoever will includes you and it includes me. Is that not wonderful news? Each one of us has the capacity to be saved. It is one thing to have the capacity. It is another for one to believe. A decision to believe is required. That is a big takeaway from the Gospel of John. Heaven is real. Heaven is perfect. Not everyone goes to heaven when they die. Only those who believe on the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, his death and burial and resurrection. Only those who make that decision of faith. It was true for Abraham. It was true of Paul. And yes, it can be true for you. A decision was and is required. I know most of you have made that decision, but likely someone that is viewing this session now has not made that decision. And perhaps you have been led to believe that that decision was already made for you. And the truth is, you have not made this decision. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, one must be born again. This applies to you and it applies to me. It applies to all of the whosoever will believe. And they will not perish, but they will have everlasting life if they do. Someone might ask, how can I know for sure? John tells us later in 1 John chapter 5 that these things I have written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know for sure even before we end this session. Let's look together and recognize. Recognize that Jesus arose on the third day and is the Savior. He is the risen Savior. Recognize that you and I are sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. Recognize that we can never earn our way to heaven. Recognize that heaven is a real place. And Jesus said in John 14, 1, I go and prepare a place for you. Think about that. Jesus has prepared a place for you if you are a believer. And as Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, salvation is a free gift. 
that we could never earn, lest any man should boast. You see, our salvation is more than just a matter of intellect. We also need to repent. Repent is a term Jesus declared to the Pharisees in Luke 13, 3. Unless you repent, change your mind, you will likewise perish. We also need to receive. If you have not ever actually made this decision, you can right now. It's where one is fully surrendering their life to Christ. You believe he is the only way to be saved. You humble yourself at the foot of the cross and cry out to Christ and ask him to be Lord of your life. And he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and sin. Jesus said in John 12, 32, that he will draw all men to him. And maybe today is the day that he is drawing you now. The offer is not just for an elect group of people predetermined before time. It is an offer extended to all image bearers of God. And the big question is, is will you accept that offer of grace? May the Holy Spirit give you a prompting and a peace about seeking Jesus and receiving him, asking him into your heart and into your life now and for all eternity. If you seek him, you will find him. You will know for sure. May I close the series with a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for being real and powerful to save. Thank you for your promises that you always keep. You always fulfill. And even now, may your gospel advance across the world and to those who hear this message. Amen. Thank you so much for viewing all 10 sessions of this study of two-part Romans. I encourage you to take the time to text or email your friends and your family members recommending this study. This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your witness and your influence is so important. As I said in the last session, we will not know this side of heaven the impact our witness has, but we do know we are commanded to bear witness. Whosoever will believe is the truth. An eternal home weighed in the balances just like Jesus declared in the Gospel of John. This study was based upon the book by Brent Lay that he published back in 2017 called Two Part Romans. I provided a link below if you would like your own copy of the book about the correct way to read Romans. If not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, and commenting. I hope you can join us for the many studies ahead as we seek to rightly divide God's holy word and show ourselves approved. I also have some important interviews on the horizon that you will not want to miss. May we exhort one another all the more as the day approaches. Go and be good. Breathe. The early church read God's word without chapter and verse markings along with no cross references or subject headings and they saw the context of the scriptures more clearly. The Exegetical Observations Workbook, available now in both the King James Version and the newly redesigned World English Bible Translation, offers an all new presentation of the text of scripture which displays just the text. Just like how the early Christians would have received 
and Reddit. Plus, it comes with built-in exegetical questions that are designed to help you dig deeper into God's Word without the theological biases, and it offers a wide margin on both sides for all your notes and your findings. And not only is this a never-before-done Bible resource tool to help you learn God's Word better, it is by far the most affordable Bible resource tool that you can get. With each book of the Bible as low as only $1 per book when you get the complete New Testament set. You can check it out at BeAGoodBerean.com. I also want to announce my partnership with two of the best well-known Bible resources out there right now. Number one is Logos Bible Software, which is the most comprehensive Bible tool for studying scripture. And my link below provides an exclusive discount on packages and resources. If you've been waiting for a deal, check it out. Also, I partnered with Dwell, which is the best Bible audio app available. Whether you're on the go or you're just relaxing at home, Dwell lets you listen to the Bible in a whole new way. You can click the link below and try it for free for seven days or get up to 30% off your subscription or lifetime access purchase. I hope you're blessed by the discounts I'm able to provide and may you study to show yourself approved.